Hello, I'm Kristen Baver, host of This Week in Star Wars, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to San Diego Comic-Con at Home Edition and our Lucasfilm Publishing panel. Today you'll hear all about some of the new and upcoming books and comics set in a galaxy far, far away. And hi, I'm Robert Simpson. I'm senior editor here at Lucasfilm. I work in the publishing division with uh, lots of other cool editors here. We work on the comics, art books, science fiction novels, all of the you know publishing that you get to read from Lucasfilm. Rob, today we have some very special guests joining us for this panel. We have Justina Ireland, Preeti Cheever, George Mann, Rebecca Rowanhorse, Alex Segura, Tom Engelberger, Timothy Zahn, Greg Pak, and Alyssa Wong. Thank you all for joining us for this panel. It's a lot of fun to do it this year, especially it being the 40th anniversary of The Empire Strikes Back's first premiere. Preeti, I am so excited to welcome you to a galaxy far, far away. Happy dance. Yeah. <laughs> <You've> written, <laughs> yes, I saw it. I saw the hands go up. <laughs> You've written a picture book that's connected to The Empire Strikes Back. Can you tell us a little bit about A Jedi You Will Be? Yeah, it's, it's first of all, the art by Mike Dees is so, so cute. It is maybe some of my favorite Star Wars related art ever. It's beautiful and like these watercolors. Um, but basically it's all of the training sessions in Empire Strikes Back and it's Yoda teaching Luke and the reader how to be a Jedi. And it's just, you know, it was really fun to write because you have to really think about what the force means to little kids and how they engage with that kind of idea of the force and that philosophical side of things. That's awesome. How did you approach writing such an iconic part of the film? Uh, I watched those scenes like 80,000 times. <laughs> and I really was like, okay, what is the force? Like it was a lot of like searching inside myself. Um, but no, it was fun. Cause you think, you know, you think about Yoda and you're like, oh yeah, he just talks backwards. So easy. But then you realize that there is a cadence and there is this kind of like thought process behind why he speaks the way he does. And so it was a lot of cutting and pasting dialogue and figuring out how it best worked to tell the story we wanted to tell within the picture book. Mm -hmm. Also, can you sum up what your conclusion was as to how kids <laughs> view the Force? Um, I think it's a combination. You know, I do think that kids are much smarter than sometimes people tend to give them credit for. And so rather than just this magical thing, understanding that the Force is exactly what Yoda says it is, right? It's this energy that flows in everything. And understanding what that means for children is like you are connected to all of the things. And so you should be conscientious about that. Um, and also beyond getting Yoda's speech pattern right, was there a challenge to writing that character? I think making sure he wasn't too kind of professorly, you know, and he, he gets a little angry in the movie sometimes, which might be a little like scary for little kids. And so it was always making sure that there was this understanding and kindness that came through, both from the illustration, I think, from Mike's illustrations and within the text itself. Well, he doesn't say, remember your failure in the cave. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little hard. I was like, oh, that's pretty scary. <laughs> a little heavy. Harsh, a little mean. <laughs> Tough love. Tough love. Yes. That's Sometimes yes. kids need that too. It's okay. <laughs> Well, it's funny, Greg, that you bring up the failure in the cave because, you know, I was going to ask you. <laughs> That's a great segue right there. As someone who's failed a lot in the cave, I can say yeah, a lot. <laughs> well, you know, you're, you're not so new to the Star Wars family, but you are new to writing uh, Darth Vader with the new relaunch that we just did of the uh, monthly series. And you're charting a new period of Vader's life that we haven't really, you know, dug into yet in those moments right after uh, the events of Empire Strikes Back. So can you tell us a little bit about that first story arc and how you approached writing Vader during that point in his life? Yeah, it's been a tremendously exciting thing to be able to do. Um, uh, uh, when I first started talking with folks about uh, about the book, when, you know, when we first started talking, and uh, uh, I kind of couldn't believe that we were getting to dig into this time period. Basically, we're uh, you know, as Star Wars fans, we all, everybody remembers, it's probably the best known moment in the whole storyline when Luke gets his hand lopped off and, you know, like, no, you know, yes, yeah, Darth Vader is his father, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, spoiler alert, sorry, for uh, whoever hasn't seen that. Um, but, uh, uh, but we tend to think of that from Luke's point of view, uh, because, you know, Luke's, Luke's our main character at that moment, right? But, um, 
but when you dig into that, you realize Vader himself is as traumatized as Luke is in that moment. Um, and that that moment is echoed purposefully multiple times throughout the series, you know, like, like Vader um, being rejected by Luke is, uh, I mean, there's a direct parallel to, uh, to younger Anakin um, in Mustafar being rejected by Padme. Um, and, uh, you know, like multiple, and then and losing his own mother. And so there are the, all these moments in time when Vader reaches out to somebody in his family, somebody he um, is deeply connected to and then is uh, rejected or loses that person in some way or another. Um, so it was tremendous to uh, be told, hey, this is the moment you want to explore this. Uh, and so what we're doing is we're exploring uh, Vader's reaction in the immediate aftermath of this, this, uh, of, of this rejection. And, um, and just the, uh, the number of doors that have been thrown open to us to, uh, to walk through and to take Vader through are astounding. Um, we've not only been able to dig into Vader's own psyche, we've also uh, been able to dig into the past and, and bring back uh, some very surprising characters, one very surprising character in particular. Um, uh, from the prequels uh, and uh, dig deep. I mean, it's this is the kind of story I love the most is is being able to do this kind of crazy fantastical stuff, but then combine it with as deep an emotional story as you can as you can do. And that's 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 what we're having the chance to do with this uh, this Vader this Vader book. And it's and it's drawn gorgeously by uh, Rafaela Ianco, who uh, who is amazing with like the machinery and the hardware and that lived in feeling of, um, of Star Wars, which, which I think is so essential that things feel real and kind of like they've been out in the sun for, for, for decades. And, um, uh, and at the same time, he's investing these, essentially these machines with so much emotion. Our two main characters in this arc are two of our main characters, two of the three main characters in this first arc are Vader and a droid, you know, uh, which are not the most expressive faces you can imagine, but, but um, you know these artists are like the cinematographers in the movie, and they're they're finding the angles, you know, to uh, and the lighting and everything else to convey those emotions. It's amazing. Well, I'm I'm glad you mentioned the prequels and the stuff that you're bringing in from that because it's it's fun to watch as you're building this story that while we're telling a story set after the events of Empire, that it really is a story that bridges across Vader's life and across by definition, Anakin's life a little bit. Mm -hmm. And as we sort of reach back and see those, you know, monumental moments in his life, you know, we get to see his encounters with, you know, Padme and his relationship with Padme, but also encounters with other characters. And as you were saying, you bring back one specific character, Sabe, you know, one yeah. of the other handmaidens. Um, what was it like uh, being able to write that character and how's the reaction been to bringing her back into the storyline as a major character? It was, it was amazing. I mean, I, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm old. So I, uh, so I grew up with the original trilogy. Uh, and, um, and I didn't, I didn't really pay huge attention to the prequels as they were coming out. You know what I mean? Like they, those were not formative to me as, I was, as they were coming out. Um, uh, but I have watched and rewatched them all uh, in, in recent years and in recent months. And there's so much, um, uh, well, first off, that, I mean, they, they are essential to this tragedy of Darth Vader, you know, this overarching storyline, which runs through all of these movies. And, um, and there's so many great little moments and great characters and uh, so many nuggets to play with, you know. Um, and, and when we got the green light to use Sabe, it was amazing because, because Vader's, his whole emotional life turns on these key relationships and one of them is Padme. Um, and uh, and and in those prequels, his his whole his whole um, the way he's tempted into the dark side is through his love for Padme and his desire to save her life. Um, uh, so to not refer to Padme in this would be a huge mistake. You know what I mean? So in this in the storyline, Padme is central, but Padme is not here. But Sabe is. There are all of these uh, handmaids who were um, you know who looked like her, who were trained to. Um, to to know her mannerisms and and who are devoted to her and uh and they're still around and to be able to use them in this story and to see how they react to vader and vader reacts to them is uh 
is tremendous. And a big shout out to E.K. Johnson, who uh, wrote the novel uh, Queen's um, Queen's Shadow, uh, which which explored those handmaids, and just came out with Queen's Peril, uh, which goes uh, back even a little further to Padme's early days. Um, uh, Though those books were tremendous and gave me a lot of, um, uh, or uh, Queen Shadow gave a lot of, uh, uh, gave me a lot to think about and play with, and she's been hugely supportive. Um, but if you like what we're doing with Vader and Sabe, definitely read uh, read Queen Shadow. Yeah, those are two amazing books, and yeah, it, it was nice to see the echoes between your stories and and Ek's stories, and how you know all of those characters just grew more and more real and more alive over those stories. Uh, can you give us a feeling about what you're going to deal with next in the next upcoming arc? Oh yeah, I can't. I, I'm trying to sort of wrap my head around how much I can say for fear of spoilers. The first two <laughs> issues of our first arc—we'll just bleep out. everything. You know. And so our, <laughs> the new story starts with uh, with six. I'll just say that um, uh, Vader, uh, uh, at the end of our first arc, Vader is uh, claims to have settled all of his previous business, um, but the Emperor. Uh, the emperor knows better. He knows that Vader hasn't settled anything, uh, and uh, and Vader um, is going to uh, suffer a terrible punishment and uh, undertake a, a new um, a new journey slash quest. And um, and there are uh, key elements that will tie into Episode Nine in a huge way. Um, uh, we've uh, once again there's some doors that have been thrown wide open, which. Um, which, which dig into some, uh, some great unexplored territory and also dig deeply into the heart of Vader. Um, and, uh, and once again, I can't believe they're letting us do it. Uh, turning to you, Tom, uh, I wanna welcome you back to the galaxy far, far away. Super excited to have you back uh, into the fold. You're certainly no stranger to Star Wars having written the original retelling of Return of the Jedi, uh, Origami Yoda, talking a lot about Yoda today, and I love Origami Yoda, as well as the mighty Chewbacca in the Forest of Fear. Now you're contributing to, from a certain point of view, The Empire Strikes Back. Can you tell us a little bit about your story and the book's cause? Well, I would love to tell you a little bit about my story, but I'm sworn to secrecy. I don't even know how much I can divulge. Um, but let me just tell you about the book in general, because it's a project that I'm just so uh, excited about. If you didn't see the first one, what they do in these books is, there's 40 authors. This is a giant team up with uh, 40 of us. And um, every author is gonna go in there and look at Star Wars from a certain point of view. We're gonna see things that were off camera or maybe see things that were on camera, but unsaid. Or we might even see people who weren't even on the same planet as the action at that time, but those actions affected them. We might see somebody that's not even Empire in an Empire Strikes Back, Maybe they don't show up until later, but this is how the actions spread out against across the galaxy. So I love being a part of this book. What really makes me happy about it, knowing that there are gonna be 39 great stories, plus mine. Um, hopefully mine will at least get a chuckle out of somebody. Some of them are gonna be really serious, and then some of them, like mine, are, are a little less serious. But the awesome thing about it is that it's a fundraiser for one of my favorite nonprofits, first book. And this is gonna blow your mind. The, what it amounts to is a $100,000 donation and 100,000 books donated. And this goes out to kids in need, kids that aren't able to get their hands on books all the time. What is such an incredible project. I'm so proud to be part of it for a second time. It's gonna be absolutely awesome. And that is such a great cause, but I'm not going to let you go yet on the, the story question. And now this is the part during a regular convention in person where you would all look down at Mike Seglane and be like, oh, what can I say? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but so since we could believe it, can you tell us what character you wrote your story about? Well, I'm, I'm so, it's one of the things, uh, someone just said, I can't believe they're letting me do it, do this. Well, I can't believe they let me do this twice. I am once again getting to write the wills. If anybody out there doesn't know that Star Wars is really the journal of the wills, it's the story retold by somebody. Well, who is that somebody? And is there another somebody that won't leave them alone and keeps making constructive criticism to the way they're telling the story? So uh, once again, my two wills are back 
to uh, battle it out and try to write the screen crawl together. Nice. We'll see if that makes that into the final version. <laughs> uh, a question that I think is probably pretty safe for you, Tom, but did you have to change your, your tone or your style at all as you shifted from writing primarily for kids to writing for adults or a, a broader, more general audience? I try not to. I think kids are the smart ones. They know what's good to read. Adults end up reading a bunch of junk that they don't even like. So I write for kids. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> That's right. Tell them, Tom. <laughs> so yeah, so I write for kids and adults, if they want to tune in, that's great. And uh, they shouldn't expect to read a bunch of that boring junk from me though. I try, I try to stay away from it. <laughs> Good, I try and stay away from the boring junk too. So you're speaking my language here. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, and it's it's so much fun to see an anthology of so many writers working together. You know, we all get to th you know see you throw your voices together and, and build this sort of world uh, out of a shared voice. And you know, jumping over to another anthology that we have coming out soon is a, a new Clone Wars anthology, uh, Stories of Shadows. And I'm sorry, I'm getting that wrong. It's Stories of Light and Dark. And you know, this is a book that's going to take a look at the events uh, that we've seen throughout the run of the Clone Wars TV series, all seven seasons, um, and sort of retell certain moments from a you know, sort of middle grade reading experience. Uh, and Tom, I think you have a story in that too? I sure do. I, I have a, uh, a story in this Clone Wars anthology too. And I can't wait for this book because I, I want more Clone Wars. I'm like so many other people out there. I want more that, that uh, the Siege of Mandalore that they just showed was one of the most incredible, some of the best Star Wars I've ever seen. I want more. And so this book is going to give it to us. Um, I got, what I got to do is actually sort of like the point of view thing again. I went back, you remember when Cad Bane tried to kidnap the Emperor and uh, Obi-Wan was undercover as a bounty hunter? Remember that whole thing? Well, we saw that from Obi-Wan's point of view. So the whole time, Obi-Wan knew what was going on. Cad Bane had no idea what was really going on. So I went back and I rewrote it from Cad Bane's point of view. So basically, here's the toughest gunslinger in the galaxy, but he's being played and he doesn't know how many different people are playing him. And man, is he going to be mad when he figures it all out. <laughs> That's great. And Preeti, I saw you react as we started to talk about the Clone Wars in the same way that I feel about the Clone Wars. Um, and you've also contributed to this anthology, mm -hmm. I think. So can you tell us a little bit about your story? Sure. Uh, when, you know, I was approached to do this, they were like, who would you want to write? And I was like, Anakin! I want to write Anakin! I can't, uh. You know, I was a teen when the prequels came out, and so I identified heavily with the angstiness and the emo-ness of Anakin Skywalker in the prequels. And the Clone Wars just kind of solidified that love for me because you really get to see him at his best, even though you know it's coming. Like, I feel like the Clone Wars, you get to see who he could have been, you know, had you know, things didn't go the way they went. Um, but so I got to write the Hostage Crisis episode where Cad Bane tries to basically take the first step in, in getting Zero the Hut out of prison. Uh, and it's all from Anakin's perspective because he knows what's going on, but he is separate from Padme. And so it was just a really fun experience to like write not only Anakin and kind of being driven by his that all consuming love for Padme, but seeing it how he sees it, which is very romantic and, you know, heroic, even though you know that that's going to be the reason he eventually falls. Cool. And Rebecca, uh, you're returning also to Galaxy Far, Far Away with us with this Clone Wars anthology. And you got to write uh, probably one of the most popular and, and, and most you know, eye-catching characters of the entire prequel trilogy, which is you know, Darth Maul. Can you tell us about writing that story? Yeah, so I had just finished uh, Resistance Reborn when uh, Jen came to me and said, hey, do you want to be in this anthology? I thought maybe you would be good writing Darth Maul. And I was like, well, I spent all this time with the rebels. Now I would love to switch gears and spend some time on the dark side. And he's such a rich character. He's such a great villain. He's smart, he's complex, uh, just, just really, really cool. So I jumped at the chance. I thought that was very cool. Um, 
And then my story, uh, actually, I picked the two episodes sort of early uh, in uh, the Clone Wars, uh, where he comes back into the scene. Uh, so he uh, is on Lothar Minor down in the tunnels and his brother uh, Savage Opress finds him down there and he's he's gone insane. You know, he's he's living in the dark, he's eating rodents, he's got a mechanical body from the waist down. He doesn't even remember his name, but the one thing he does remember is Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? He's obsessed with his revenge against Obi-Wan. And that's sort of what brings him back. And I thought, wow, like, that's deep. <laughs> and so I got, I wrote that uh, sort of from his perspective, you know, for a middle grade audience. So I just went full out, you know, in voice and, and trying to get into his head and what that must feel like uh, to be obsessed with revenge like that deeply. And he does get his sanity back. He goes uh, and um, is restored. And then he goes, you know, sort of to, to track down Obi-Wan. Uh, and everything that follows from that. So yeah, I loved it. I would write him again. Hint, hint. <laughs> any, any time, any time. Any time. And it was really fun. You know, the book also has some really cool art. I want to give a shout out to uh, Ksenia, who's a really popular Instagram artist, who's you know has spot art throughout the entire book. So I think that's really going to help bring a lot of these stories to life. You know, but yeah, that Art Darth Maul story sounds like so much fun. And and again, you mentioned Resistance Reborn. Uh, what's the reaction been to that since that book's just recently out? How's that writing Poe and those characters? In this oh, book? amazing. It's Everybody's been really positive. Uh, I think people have really appreciated uh, filling in that time gap between Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker and sort of what people were up to because Last Jedi really left you kind of hanging. Uh, and so I've gotten really positive feedback from that. That's awesome. And Rebecca, you're not the only person on this panel who's written Poe Dameron. Alex, you just got to write about Poe Dameron for the upcoming uh, YA novel, Freefall. Can you talk about how you approach that character? Yeah, I mean, if if I had the choice of a character, it would have been Poe. So it was nice when, when Mike approached me and asked, you know, would you be up for this? Of course I was. But it's really a it's a crime novel in space. You know, it, it answers a lot of the questions you have from Rise of Skywalker, like what was his time in the Spice Runners like? Who is this Zori Bliss character? We have Babu in there too. But it, it's a coming of age story. It's, it's you know, him coming to terms with his parents and who his parents were and, and trying to define himself in relation to them. But it's also a heist novel. It's also a shootout. And uh, it's just a lot. It was just a really a lot of fun. I got to throw in a bunch of stuff that I wanted to do and, uh, add to the mythos, which I think was the coolest, the biggest honor to be able to add a few characters and, and, and be part of this canon. So, mm -hmm. And it makes a lot of sense that you would write a crime novel in space because you're probably best known outside of the Star Wars circles for your Pete Fernandez mystery novels. Um, can you talk about how you applied some of your that crime and mystery background to, to this book and what fans can expect from Freefall beyond just the, the formative story of Poe Dameron's uh, you know, youth and coming to terms with that background? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, a lot of it is really just knowing how to play the mystery, how to leave a few clues early on and get somebody engaged. And, uh, you know, one of the first characters you meet is a young girl about Poe's age named Zori Wynn. So obviously she's going to lead into something else and, and be revealed to something else. And so it's, it's kind of teasing that journey and also answering questions, but showing Poe at his best and giving readers enough of an inkling of the Poe that we're going to see in the latest trilogy and kind of watching him evolve, which was, which was fun to do just to be able to orchestrate that in some way. Does Zori already have the helmet? I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> you will see the helmet for sure. Yes. Okay. No further questions. <laughs> I fold. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, I want to move over to you, Alyssa, and, and again, welcome you to writing for uh, the Star Wars family of, of, you know, characters and worlds and, and, you know, outer space fun. I mean, you've had a long writing career on other kinds of things, on novels, you know, video games, you know, but now that you're writing Dr. Aphra, you know, what, how are you feeling about, you know, taking that next step and telling the story of everybody's favorite, you know, uh, corrupt archaeologist in, in space? I just love her. I love her so much. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, like, really excited. Um, yeah, no, I think she's a delight. Um, I love characters who are selfish and messy, um, and Afra is sort of the epitome of that to me. Um, you know, she's always out for herself, and um, in some way that's a very pure motivation. Um, it means that you can do, I mean, from externally, um, 
she's out there, she's causing chaos in a lot of people's lives, but um, she's always very true to who she is. And there's a very strong internal logic there. Um, I think that uh, something I love about Afra is she has this potential to really surprise you um, with either like moments of vulnerability or like moments of betrayal. And um, I have a deep weakness for characters who are really selfish, who are forced by like the, the moral compass that they keep trying to crush uh, to do something good for other people. And um, that's, that's something I love about Afra. Um, so, I mean, uh, Kieran Gillen and Cy Spurrier did such a lovely job with uh, the first volume of Dr. Afra, and that's um, how I fell in love with the character. So um, when y'all asked me if I wanted to take over for uh, the second volume, um, I was really excited, but also really intimidated. <laughs> um, I think it's really hard to uh, essentially pick, take the reins up um, from uh, people whose work you really admire but it's also really exciting because um, you get to put your own stamp on it. Um, so at the end of volume one, um, Afra is alone. She's off on a new adventure. Um, she's cut ties with the people she loves um, because uh, she keeps, you know, <laughs> she keeps wrecking their lives um, and she wants what's best for them. Um, so with these new Afro adventures, um, something that I really wanted is I really wanted it to be accessible for people who had never read Afra before, um, as well as like exciting for the people who were really invested in her as a character. Um, so, you know, in this new volume, um, she's got a new crew. Um, she's on her own. Um, like a lot of the characters from the previous uh, volume are um, off doing their own thing. Um, so hopefully, so she's really building from the ground up. So hopefully, like, she's a lot more um, accessible and less intimidating uh, for people who are like, oh, God, I have to catch up on 40 issues of this comic to really know what's going on. Well, that's been fun to watch that new supporting cast grow. You know, now it feels a little bit more like a team book in a lot of ways where, you know, it's just not her adventure, but it's all of the characters' adventures. Um, can you tell us a little bit about each of those characters? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, in, this new, um, in this new adventure, uh, Afra is hunting for these super valuable uh, artifacts, uh, the Rings of Veil, vale, which are the last um, remaining uh, artifacts of a forgotten civilization. Um, so her team is built up of um, a combination of uh, mercenaries and uh, <laughs> academics. Um, so uh, we have um, Dr. Eustacia Aka. Um, she is a disgraced professor um, who used to teach at the Shadow University. Uh, she was, uh, she studies like weird occulty stuff and uh, she was expelled for insufficient credible research. Um, She's a Marilyn, um, and she's an old flame of Afros. Um, there's uh, Daddy Yao. Uh, she's a grad student, uh, super bubbly. Um, she plays dumb, but there is something vicious under under all that, and I love that. Um, there's uh, Just Lucky. Um, he's a mercenary. Um, I wanted to write um, sort of like a handsome, one of those classic handsome dashing uh, Star Wars characters. Um, but I really wanted to write a Southeast Asian guy um, because I feel like you don't really see those characters very often. Um, and um, as I mean, my mom's Filipino, so it was really important to me. Um, but uh, something I love about him is that his relationship with Afra is um, like, you know, she backstabs people all the time. And um, like his relationship with Afra is very professional. So sometimes they work together, sometimes they're trying to kill each other, but it's like this weird friendly rivalry thing where they never really take it personally. And I think that if either of them actually succeeded in killing the other, they'd be really disappointed. Um, and of course, a familiar face, um, Black Chrysanthemum, uh, the mercenary Wookiee, uh, giant, Afra owed him money, now they're working together, but like, I don't know, for how long? We just don't know. Yeah, it's fun to see characters who you, you want to have be her, you know, steadfast allies, of course, have a grudge against her. So, you know, it's, it's certainly fun seeing Black K come back, but also knowing that 
he's got history with her. So he's got her back, but he's also got his eye on her throughout all of it. And, and just watching how those characters uh, sort of interweave. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what you have in store for the, for the good doctor down the road? <laughs> um, well, uh, I love horror writing. Um, it's like my, my core, my background. Um, so uh, what I can tell you about this next arc is um, that it is spooky and it is weird. Um, and um, I feel like I should also mention um, that I'm working with uh, Marika Cresta, who's an incredible artist. Um, Rochelle Rosenberg is doing colors and Valentina uh, Raminar is doing the covers. Um, so they're all fantastic. Um, and uh, Marika is bringing in some like very HR Geigery feelings um, to this new arc. So I'm super stoked about that. Um, and the main villain, uh, is this guy, Ronan Tag, um, who is like the spoiled uh, rich boy uh, scion of the powerful Tag family. Um, so I feel like everybody knew someone like this, like um, just a terrible, mean, really selfish guy who has never really been told no. Um, so his whole deal is he likes to be the last person to touch like something, like an artifact. Um, and so once he's done that, he acquires things so he can destroy them. Mm -hmm. You know, all this talk about archaeologists and fan favorite characters is really reminding me of everyone's favorite blue skin chis, Thrawn. Yeah. Uh, Tim, can you tell us a little bit about um, what it's been like to write Thrawn again? Obviously, he's been a big part of your life for many, many years. And I imagine it's a little bit like visiting with an old friend who is very deadly and you want to watch what he puts in your tea? Uh, pretty much. I mean, I've been writing him so long, it's not like I have to remember how how he functions, how he thinks. It's just meeting up with him again. I've got his mental patterns, his uh, you know, tactical ideas pretty much already established in my mind. I just have to put him in new situations and uh, figure out exactly how he would solve them. Uh, how we would interact with the people around him and, uh, and that sort of thing. Does this mean at all times there's just like a little Thrawn in your head and you just flip the switch and you're like, okay, now we're thinking like Thrawn. <laughs> uh, I have regular communication with him, yes. Uh, <laughs> put, do, do with that as you will. Great. Wonderful. And a new Thrawn uh, Ascendancy trilogy starts this September, doesn't it? Uh, so what can fans expect out of that first book? So with these, this trilogy, I'm being able to basically build up the Chiss ascendancy in the culture from the ground up. Uh, is exploring how the families work, how the military works, their relationships with others in the area. Um, the, the focus will be on Thrawn, of course, his interactions, bringing a whole bunch of new characters in, of course, and the, uh, the emergence of a threat against the ascendancy, that uh, someone's got them the, the ascendancy in their sights, and it's going to be up to our heroes to figure out where these attacks are coming from, how they're being done, and how to deal with them. All this talk about Thrawn reminds me of uh, you know, just some of the amazing tales that we brought to life, including George, uh, all the way across from the all the way from across the pond, George Van, uh, who previously wrote the Myths and Fables book. Uh, very much the Grimm's fairy tales of the Star Wars galaxy, and I love it, and I am here for it. Um, now, George, I understand there's an in-world version of the book that's debuting this year at Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, and it's going to include some additional stories Yeah, yeah. beautiful I'm... art. Can you tell <laughs> us a little bit about that? Spill all the details, I can. please. <laughs> I'm really excited about this because it's, I, I mean, I can't wait to see it myself. It's going to look like an artifact bomber, too, um, and it's got six brand new stories in it along with six fantastic pieces of art from Grant Griffin who illustrated the first um, set of stories um, and he you know Grant for me every piece he does just gets better and better and better and as, as I was writing these new stories getting the art coming through is so inspiring to see you know, there's an idea I have and then Grant brings it to life and then I write that into the story a little bit more and go a little bit deeper um, so they're really nicely working together the, the stories and the, and the, and the artwork um, so the stories are very much in keeping with the stuff we've already seen. Grimm's fairy tales, uh, cautionary tales, and, and um, you know, moral tales. 
but we're going a little bit further afield with these. So um, we do return to Batu, um, because why not? We're, we're gonna, it's an artifact from Batu. We want to, to delve into that um, mythology of that world a little deeper. But we also go across to Endor and take a look at the origin of the Golden One story. Um, we go to Dathomir and visit uh, Darth Maul's youth. Um, we go to Mon Cala and there's kind of a, a, a reverse Icarus story about children who swim too deep and what they might wake down in the depths of the trench. Uh, and that's the fun part about, you know, Grimm's fairy tales is that, you know, while they're happy stories sometimes, there are also that sort of slight edge of fear that, you know, is, is peppered into them. And, you know, you touched on that slightly with the Mist of Able stories, but you also, you know, we have a new book coming up, uh, uh, taking a slightly darker turn with the stories in, in Dark Legends is the title of that one. It's kind of a follow-up, similar format, but can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so we've gone full on dark side. Um, it's, yeah, we really wanted to delve into the, the darker, spookier, creepier areas of the of the Star Wars universe with some stories. And it really kind of came out of doing the work on the first book. You know, um, Michael Sklane and I, both big fans of the kind of the horror genre and spooky stories and classic ghost stories. And we were talking a lot about the types of story we wanted to put in the first book. And there were a few of those darker tales in there. Um, but the ideas just kept coming and we just kept talking them through and kind of it led to a natural point where we went, let's just keep going. Let's, 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 let's push into this and do some, some darker stories. Um, so like um, Tom was saying earlier, we're, um, you know, they're, they're scary stories. They are suitable for children, but they're also, they've got that grim fairy tale edge to them. Um, and that was one of the interesting challenges about writing these things was, was sending them in and Mike kind of going, make a little bit darker. I go, okay. A little bit darker. <laughs> it's like, oh, we're really going into the dark side now. Um, but yeah, it was great fun. And, you know, there's, to give you an idea of a couple of the stories, there's, there's a story about the Grand Inquisitor um, set just like in the aftermath of the Clone Wars uh, at, at an orphanage where children who've um, you know, been disrupted by the, the wars a bit, have been found and, and being looked after and, um, and four sensitive children keep disappearing. And they've got this this story about this, creature that comes in the night through the window and, and spirits them away um and how one brave girl makes sure she stays awake to see what's happening and and, and steps in um and, and calls for help um another example is a, a story set on exegol um which was great fun to do because i was writing that just in the run-up to the film coming out and and being able to hear a few of the little secrets about what was going to happen um and we're exploring in that that, that kind of whole thing that um, the Emperor was trying to do, that whole Sith quest for immortality. And, um, and this is a kind of an ancient story about a, a, a Sith who's tried before to, to win immortality and, and the, the price of, of that, the price of, of immortal life and, and what it does to a person um, who, who can achieve it or get close to it. Uh, like, um, like most of these kind of Grimm's fairy tales, you have a sting in the tail of, of most of these stories. So. Um, no one gets what they, they, they quite expect by the end of the tale. Does he get a jar full of Snokes, though? Is there just like, that's it? <laughs> 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 no one wants to tell you, but here's your Snokes. <laughs> <laughs> and they like sea monkeys of Star Wars. Like, you yeah. got to feed them. They're going to grow. You're it's like, oh, I want to live forever. I got this. <laughs> Thank our Snokes, yeah. Yes. Awesome. Brilliant. All right. I love all this dark side talk, but Star Wars is about balancing the darkness and the light. So I'm going to turn our attention now to the luminous Justina Ireland. That's me. That's you. <laughs> Justina, we know that you and your fellow luminaries are hard at work on the High Republic series uh, with your book, A Test of Courage, launching in January 2021 now. We also know that you've been sworn to secrecy, as all of you are on many things. I have. Yes, but in a letter to fans earlier this year, we were told that we could ask you a bit more about the initiative. So I'm going to just leap into it here and say, please tell us more about the Stars Connection. Oh, the Stars Connection. Um, so if fans are familiar with Santa Staros, who appears in Daniel Jose Older and other Luminaries Last Shot, and um, a few of the comics, including Dr. Dr. Afra. Um, we know she is the best scoundrel to ever have scoundrel. Um, she has no shame. She's out there to get what she needs to get. And she's uh, sort of ruthless. And she's just my, sort of my favorite. But High Republic takes place, of course, 
many hundreds of years earlier before she exists. And so what we're going, who we're going to meet instead of Santa is her great, great, many times great um, ancestor. We won't get a direct, direct relation there because, you know, genetics are murky in the Star Wars galaxy. Um, and <laughs> who we get to meet is Avon Starros. And Avon is a 12-year-old girl. She has been sent to the edge of the galaxy by her mother, who's a, a Republic senator, um, because she's just trouble. Like, she is a scientist, and the only thing she wants to know are the answers to the questions that drive her. So, you know, how does the force work from a scientific perspective? That might be something a 12-year-old wants to know. What happens if you take a kyber crystal out of a lightsaber? You know, what does that look like? So, um, along with Vernestra Rowe, who we uh, met earlier in the year when we did the High Republic reveal, um, Avon is on this ship going to, on this diplomatic mission um, to the great um, pinnacle of of the current age, and that's the Starlight Beacon. And of course, terrible things happen because it would not be a story if there wasn't something terrible happening <laughs> to disrupt everyone's day. Um, but Avon, of course, her mother is smart. She did not send her to the edge of the galaxy alone. She has a droid um, named J6. And J6 is based on ME89. Um, she has that same kind of styling. If you look at the cover, you can see Avon and J6, um, like kind of just like walking through the, the jungle. And, um, J6, of course, has fallen prey to Avon's very curious experimental nature. And so there's something going on with her speech patterns. And um, part of the fun of writing a kid's book is kids see the punchline coming before you give it to them. So setting that up for them as they go through the story is kind of the best. So um, Avon and J6 have been um, sort of like, they're, they are the the characters of my heart because I was also that kid who always got in trouble because I asked the wrong question at the wrong time. Um, and so it was just, it's just a really great, it's a lot of fun to, to be able to play this new time period and, and have these characters and then to also be able to, you know, show them growing throughout a narrative. I can already tell that Avon is one of those kids too that for every answer, the next question is, but why? But why? But why? And so it just like there's no satisfaction in getting an answer. They're just going to keep going and pushing and trying to, to figure and then out she's, more, and more. And then she's going to diagram your answer to tell you how it's wrong, like <laughs> on the based on the relevant data. So yeah, it was a lot of fun to write her. She sounds like a load of fun on a on a road trip. Yeah, she <laughs> just imagine. <laughs> uh, is there anything else, Justine, that you can tell us about a test of courage? I think um, I think it's all I can tell you because I can like feel the emails from Michael right. Seglang coming in if I say anything else. But I do <laughs> encourage you all to just keep um, keep with us throughout the summer and there will be more reveals. Obviously, we still don't know, you know, tell us about the Santacas. What's a storm? I know, but I'm not telling. So um, definitely keep keep <laughs> following on StarWars.com so you can see all of those reveals as we as we give them to fans throughout the summer. All right, Rob, you've been putting a lot of people in the hot seat today, so I'm going to put you in the hot seat for just a quick second here. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> as a member of the Lucasfilm editorial team, besides everything that we've already talked about on this panel, because that's we're, we're done. We've already got that excitement out. We're super uh, intrigued by all of these new things that are coming out. But what are you looking forward to that we haven't discussed yet? Oh, gosh. There are so many fun books that we're working on in other projects, you know, both myself and all the other editors uh, on, on the Lucasfilm publishing team. Uh, of the ones I'm working on, I guess, you know, I, I'm really enjoying, along with Greg's uh, Darth Vader relaunch this year in 2020, we relaunched uh, the monthly Star Wars book with Charles Soule. And uh, Ethan uh, Sachs is writing the uh, Bounty Hunters book. So both of those are going, as well as, you know, Dr. Afra. So all of those are building a nice new... Uh, storyline for that post you know empire time that you know as we're here in this 40th anniversary year so those are lots of fun um i'm really looking forward to the relaunch uh of star wars adventures from idw we're going to you know give that a reboot as well and tell stories from a lot of different time periods with that with a lot of new creators so that's going to be a lot of fun to watch explore and a book that i've been co-editing with another editor here that is going to be so gorgeous for everybody to get a look at um is uh it's called the lightsaber collection and we're doing that with the folks at Inside Editions, and it's going to be a comprehensive book. If anybody's seen the Harry, Wong, Harry Potter Wands book, this is a, a sort of a partner book to that of every lightsaber hilt throughout all nine movies, all of the TV series. Um, beautifully new rendered portraits of each lightsaber wielder, 
as well as in-depth looks at the creation of each of their lightsabers with lots of you know cool interviews and backstory. So th those are going to be a lot of fun for people to page through. That's awesome. We also have a couple other pieces of news to share before we get going on and wrap up this panel. Uh, we are once again returning to Mustafar with Shadows of Vader's Castle, uh, which is going to be a 30 page one shot from IDW written by creepy Kevin Scott with covers by frightening Francesco Fregavala and devilish Derek Charm. And it's coming in October just in time for Halloween. Oh, and actually that reminds me, uh, as far as uh, stories about Batu, if you can't get enough of you know, stories about Batu, uh, we'd like to also, you know, announce, introduce, you know, show uh, the cover of The Art of Galaxy's Edge. This is the next book in our series of Art of books that we've done for all of the movies, but this is taking a deep dive into the art and concept creation for uh, the themed lands at Disney World and Disneyland. So this is gonna be a look at everything from you know, the design of the buildings, the design of the characters, the design of the costumes. Um, and it's being uh, coming out from our friends at Abrams and it's being written by Amy Radcliffe. Yeah, who's written many Star Wars projects for us before. Yes. And Amy Radcliffe was one of our panelists on the very first, the Star Wars Show Book Club. Um, so if you haven't already, make sure to check out the show where we revisit some of our favorite comics and books and we have exclusive interviews with authors and creators. Super fun time. Any of you guys on this panel want to be readers? You just come call me. Okay, I'll get you on the list. <laughs> and for any other Star Wars publishing news, and there is a lot more to come, uh, be sure to check out StarWars.com and This Week in Star Wars. Uh, thank you all for joining us today at home and on the panel for SDCC at Home, and may the Force be with you.